I will start our journey. And that begins with kind of the spark of inspiration for this show. And I was essentially um, standing outside of my elevator in my apartment building, very absentmindedly reading the fire escape sign, when uh, it really just kind of struck me as being incredibly ironic. Um, that morning I'd been listening to the uh, news and there'd been a lot of reports on the kind of untamable chaos of the BC wildfires as well as months prior the Oregon and Washington wildfires um, that was in pandemic lockdown of about 2021. So the fire safety sign read if you discover fire followed by a list of safety and escape measures. It was really that first line if you discover fire that I found ironic because the human species evolved biologically um, and created society as we know it because of our discovery of fire and harnessing its power. Now in the 21st century, due to human advancement and its effect on global warming, we are now being exposed to the agency of fire. So basically it's sublime presence and destructive power. So standing in front of that elevator, I watched this kind of high speed reel of human history go through my mind at that time. And Relatively recently, Euro-Caucasians were placed on pedestals in response to this Western Enlightenment culture subsidized by the Industrial Revolution and colonialism. Man was kind of, you know, considered to be above the forces of nature and able to harness its power and essentially submit it to experiments and create from it something that hadn't previously um, been in the natural world. What was ignored from this kind of viewpoint was the inherent intelligence of nature. Charles Darwin kind of brought the idea of evolution into our vocabularies, but I think there's much more work to be done in this untethering of the Western definition of uh, intelligence and agency from human-based progress. So for myself, I consider intelligence and agency in the non-human as a self-correcting uh, action or growth and more in favor of ecological balance. So enter fire. So humans are estimated to have discovered fire about 500,000 years ago, and we can thank our Homo erectus ancestors for noticing lightning fires and harnessing their energy. Uh, beyond its use as a defense against predators, a tool for cooking food, and a provider of light, which did all aid in our biological development, I'd like to highlight fire's effect on the human social development. So it's been hypothesized that the obviously consumption of cooked meats helped, you know, build a greater mental capacity and the ability to um, increase community and network sizes. We also were able to develop language and build more social structures. So the drastic increase in brain size of our ancestors was a direct result of their ability to harness fire, which required organization and the division of labor to maintain and tend. So in this sense, it's highly likely that the that fire birthed the human social brain. As humans evolved to develop mythologies and food cultivation practices, we placed a lot of reverence on fire and lightning. After all, the Bible's creation story begins with God's command of let there be light. The recurring sentiment was essentially that fire has this um, spiritual origin, that it's some otherworldly power and is this lively being in the ways that it uh, acts or its ability to destroy and bring new life. So these beliefs reshape themselves continuously throughout various religions, myths, and cultures. For instance, the uh, ancient Greeks, for example, in Prometheus's gift, it said that Prometheus stole fire back from Zeus, returning it to humans, essentially giving them the <laughs> um, power of fire, leading to their progress in forming civilizations through technological development and increased intelligence. Um, and from this, um, Prometheus was actually punished dearly by Zeus, forced to, uh, well, he was chained to a rock and forced to have his liver eaten every day continuously for the rest of his life. And as for humans, uh, we didn't get off scot-free. Um, he sent down to us Pandora's box. <laughs> uh, so fire has also been a cornerstone of representations of the divine power in Christianity. One notable Bible passage being that of Moses in the burning bush, where God appears to Moses in the desert um, in the form of fire, consuming a bush but not burning it. And in early Northern European folklore, fire's connection to the otherworldly is clear in the line of a Finnish poem spell from the Merovingian period. 
period ranging roughly from the 5th century until the year 751. It reads, from the rock water is born, fire is born of heaven. Where was, rock, where was fire rocked, light swaddled, there up in the sky on the crest of the mount? In Swedish folklore, the fire-striking god uh, was named Yuko, and he was attributed with creating thunderstorms, lightning, friction fire, and rains that all helped to foster a fertile land. So he was pretty essential to farmers at the time, which were Sweden farmers, and they would pray to Yuko to help them generate friction fires in order to burn clear land for planting. So in early European cultures, fire's abilities were attributed to deities and transcended human power. Um, so fire began, or fire being a source of security, light, food, and life, could just as easily flip and present its destructive qualities. Existing with fire, like existing with a god or a god, is a delicate balance, a relationship to be treated with respect and careful tending. So this Swidden farming through controlled burns, um, which were one of the earliest methods of cultivation amongst indigenous and early European cultures. Generally, controlled burns are low temperature burns that increase soil fertility by um, converting all the nutrients in dead plants into a more accessible form of nutrients. Um, they're used to typically clear land, rejuvenate it, and help grow certain plant species to build habitats for large animals like elk. Controlled burns tend to shape the landscape as well because certain species thrive under fire conditions while others will disappear entirely. Before European colonial settlement set in, Sweden farming, also known as uh, shifting cultivation, or some of you might know it as slash and burn farming, um, which has a bit more of a negative connotation, um, was a common practice for food cultivation across Europe and in indigenous cultures. The practice traditionally didn't rely on land rights, so it was kind of like rotational farming. Um, you would kind of take over a plot of land, burn clear, cultivate it for a few years, and then leave it to regenerate. And then a new group would come in and repeat the process. So in order to generate fires for controlled burns and other practices, uh, things like striking stones and flints became a really common tool. Across Europe, striking stones uh, were often made into this very distinct oval shape. And this oval shape is thought to represent the vulva and is sourced back to a Finnish goddess, Rauni. Rauni, the goddess of fertility of the soil, was the partner of Yuko, the fire striking god mentioned earlier, and is referred to as one with the ability to entice Yuko to strike fire by exposing her bare chest to him. Ladies, we got the power. <laughs> um, she's mentioned in an excerpt from an Austro-Bithanian Swedish spell for putting out forest fire. The spell reads, the spark came from stone, the flame lit from a chip. Do you know the evildoer? I know the evildoer arose the virgin from the spring with her breasts of gold. The implied mischievousness of evildoer accompanying Rowney's overt sexuality ties together a sense of loss of control and danger. At the same time, the couple's sexual attraction and resulting creation of fire directly associates fire with the power to give life. For farmers, the vulva-shaped flintstone perhaps remained a symbol of the complex power dynamics of fire. Speaking of fertility and changes in landscapes, there are certain plant species that have evolved to actually create fire survival techniques for themselves, with some actually relying entirely on forest fires to be able to propagate. For instance, some species grow thicker bark, which is more fire resistant and provides protection. Um, other species, such as jack pine, grow serotonous cones, which are essentially uh, seed pods <clears throat> that are quite thick and sturdy, sealed with resin. So the seeds can actually um, mature within the cone and don't release themselves until fire passes through and allows the cone to open, <clears throat> allowing the seed to be carried by wind or gravity to plant itself, essentially. Um, the um, high temperatures are the ones responsible for melting the resin. So other species have evolved extensive and rhizomatic root systems which store nutrients and allow the plant to regrow rapidly after a fire. So blueberries are one such plant. Um, typically, they have a very extensive rhizome network underground, and like an iceberg, that 12 to 14 inch bush that we see is just like a tip. Um, so that upper growth can be completely burned away and die, and the plant will remain living underground, able to re-spurt up um, and actually produce fruit within a matter of three years after. 
Um, that was one thing that indigenous cultures did was to propagate blueberries. So the presence of fire is therefore <clears throat> the presence of rejuvenated life in certain ecosystems. The indigenous communities that have stewarded these lands since time immemorial have always harbored a deep respect for the relationship with fire. The Gangakum Nation elders, uh, which is a region in Northern Ontario, interviewed by author and professor Ian Davidson Hunt, offered insight into their cultural understandings of other than human liveliness. They described how numerous beings, including plants, animals, and rocks, possess agency similar to humans. They can think, make decisions, and pursue their own life projects. These other than human beings can transform themselves and the environment and respond in willful ways. Elder Tom Quill, a former fire crew boss, describes how fire contains its own agentic qualities. Among them are fire's ability to grow very rapidly, uh, to resist being put out, and instead decide to go out on its own. Um, to fuel itself internally, it can create internal wind that will feed its own flames, and it can also migrate uh, using flying embers called firebrands, which typically help to spread itself further, even able to jump rivers and roads to create smaller spot fires. So as our societies have transformed through agricultural, industrial, and scientific revolutions, Western Euro-Caucasians' relationship with fire began to change too. We've tended to divorce nature from the human equation. Fire fell from deity to less than human, a power to be harnessed for our own will and suppressed otherwise. In Western eyes, human intelligence became the dominant definition of agency. As we're getting deeper into environmental crisis, I think there's no better time than now to empower, listen, and learn from indigenous cultures. How we conceptualize the beings we live with has a major effect on how we treat them. A shift in thinking towards the human as an ecologically entangled body, among other organic, inorganic, and elemental forces, could entirely shift the path we're on. Now, I told you this was going to be a journey, so I'm going to rewind back to 450 BCE, because <laughs> I would like to bring up Greek philosopher Empedocles and his theory of vision. So Empedocles' theory of vision is basically the oldest on record, and he proposed that vision functions similarly to a lantern. Essentially, a visual ray is emitted from the eyes, um, a sense of some kind of fire almost, and that this ray acts almost like a finger, reaching out and acting as a sense of touch, and then returning back to the eye with that information. Um, <clears throat> he also believed that objects released their own rays containing information about their surfaces that, would, that our eyes would pick up on. So it's almost this dual interaction of rays. <clears throat> As author David Park succinctly summarizes in his book, The Fire Within the Eye, there are different kinds of fire and only one of them is what we call a flame. Empedocles' version of vision, though obviously, as we know, not accurate, um, set a precedent for how future generations conceptualize perception and therefore human involvement and integration in the world around them. So Empedocles positioned human as, humans as an entity expanding kind of beyond their bodily limits to interact with and be affected by the elements around them. Vision didn't simply happen to us. There was an external actors at play and a dual relationship of affect and effect. And Empedocles' theories tended to influence many other philosophers, so Lucifus being one who invented the idea of an atom, and hypothesized that our senses actually flow from the external world into our bodies. His hypothesis was meant to extrapolate on, on Empedocles' claim that objects around us give off rays of information about themselves. To explain this further, Lucifus came up with eidolons. As he taught it, eidolons are thin veils of matter produced by objects, approximately one atom thick, I don't know what they thought that was at the time, <laughs> um, yet to be clarified, which, which essentially radiate off of objects, traveling at immense speeds in every direction. So eidolons are basically considered these replicas that would peel off from objects and retain the object's shape and eventually travel to our eye. Eidolons were later termed simulacra, a Latin term for likeness. To all my art friends out there, there's a we're not going down that hole. <laughs> so theories of vision and the role of fire within it continued to transform with the Stoics in 384 to 322 BCE. The Stoics saw the universe as a living being, rational, animate, and intelligent. To them, nature, also referred to as pneuma, is an artistically working fire. 
going on its way to create. It's a fiery, creative, or fashioning breath. The Stoics often refer to the universe being held together by pneuma, considered to be some kind of gas or vapor of fire. The word itself has many meanings and can actually denote breath, nature, the mind, rationality, vital spirit, or even God. But as nerves and the workings of the optic system were being discovered and pieced together by doctors and philosophers, pneuma was attributed to the functioning of vision. So pneuma would travel from the brain out the optic nerve into the world, collect information, and then return into the eye. So through each new theory, you can kind of see how Empedocles' initial hypothesis remained to some degree. And this would actually be the case all the way up until the 19th century. What I find interesting about Empedocles' hypothesis is that he captured this meaningful depiction of human interaction with the world that kind of breaks from the idea of humans as individual and penetrable bodies. Empedocles was suggesting that human experience is a constant conversation with our environment, a process of taking in as well as reaching out. The Enlightenment period brought an end to Empedocles' effect on theory in the West, and rapid advancements in science and technology shifted to a worldview with humans at the core of our experience. So other than human world became um, a resource to exploit and study. As colonial settlers began genocide against indigenous cultures, removing them from the land, they established permanent farms and settlements, bringing with them logging and railroad industries. So European, um, Pardon me, the lands that indigenous had stewarded were then left untended, became very overgrown, and dramatically shifted the uh, cyclical fire regimes of ecosystems. European influence changed the usual low intensity uh, brush fires to these high intensity fires that would actually level forests and burn them down to stumps, essentially. And around 1894, drought, intentional burning, and accidental fires caused some caused by the sparks of passing trains even, resulted in increases of destructive forest fires. The Kangakum Nation elders Solomon Turtle and Matthew Strang spoke to their own and their ancestral relationships with fire tending um, in interviews. So from Elder Solomon Turtle in an interview from April 17, 2007, you also have to have respect to be careful of fire. You have to use it wisely. If you use it wisely, it will keep you. If not, it will burn all your possessions. You know when we eat, it nourishes our bodies. We get strength and good health. So fire does the same thing. It helps us physically, it strengthens our health. And from Elder Matthew Strang in an interview June 12, 2006, our way was to build fires on a big rock near the water, never someplace where the fire might go into the, lounge, into the ground. We were always very careful with fire. We have a clean record. We would build a fire by the shoreline. I was personally struck by Elder Matthew Strang's comment about fire going into the ground. Smoldering fires can burrow and burn deep into the organic soil, and these fires can smolder for months and reignite um, when temperatures rise and conditions get dry again. So the oldest smoldering fire in the world is actually 6,000 years old, and it's, yeah, <laughs> it's on Burning Mountain in Australia. That's a uh, coal seam fire. On the climate crisis stage, peat fires are actually one of the most detrimental type of smoldering fires due to their high intensity uh, burning, carbon emissions that they release, and the drastic haze events that they produce. So that's having very detrimental impacts on obviously global warming crisis, but also human health. So peat fires happen to be the hardest to detect and to put out because they're extremely resistant to firefighting with water and they sometimes require um, satellite technology to discover what their actual radius is. Um, and much like a rhizome system, like I was speaking about with the blueberry bushes, um, the burned area might be quenched by water, but might have other areas that continue to you know, burn, and they reignite surface fires months later. So smoldering fires are actually becoming in an increasing occurrence in the Arctic and contributing to the thawing of permafrost, which is capable of releasing ancient viruses. Yes, that sounds horrifying and carbon that is more than 10,000 years old into our atmosphere. I also want to share with you um, this very interesting map from NASA. So this is actually available online, and it's an interactive map. So you can see they've got um, like the current time period. I had a photo here for 24 hours, and the different color codes of all the fires that have been burning across the world, um, with the darker red being as little as 
uh, igniting as little as one hour ago, and the whiter portions are fires that have been burning for more than 24 hours. So you can even do a historical search and search for months. That gets really scary. It looks like the world's on fire, but <laughs> it's not. <laughs> um, but I thought that was a really interesting um, way to visualize because I find we get caught up in our own regions and uh, forget about the global scale as well. At this time, too, I'd like to acknowledge and send thoughts to the communities in Alberta who have, at this time, been enduring 87 wildfires, I think 24 of which, when I last did this, um, were listed as out of control. So 19,000 residents have been evacuated from their communities, and First Nations communities have also been deeply affected, um, with four nations being evacuated and extensive damage done in Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation and Fox Lake in uh, Little Little Red River Cree Nation. That brings me to the demonization of fire. The fire status took a very long and hard fall in Western culture. Um, it began as an extension of divine entities and their power, and by the 1890s, fire was considered this almost destructive demon. The fire suppression movement uh, began in America around 1890 until the 1980s, approximately. It was spurred by the concern um, over environmental destruction resulting from wildfires caused by industrial logging practices. <laughs> and despite controlled burns being used for millennia by indigenous cultures uh, to invigorate ecosystems, the Forest Service declared in 1910 that prescribed fires were destructive. So we're all familiar with Bambi and Smokey the Bear, um, who were part of campaigns to essentially get communities to be more hyper aware of um, accidental fire starting in the environment. Um, and there are these cute animals that we can kind of empathize with and agree that, you know, wildfires are bad. Um, but there's li very little distinction given at the time between harmful wildfires and beneficial kind of naturally occurring forest fires. In the Great uh, Smoky Mountains National Park alone during the fire suppression ban, the um, cycle between wildfire outbreaks increased from an average of 12.7 years between 1856 and 1940 to an average of every 2,000 years during the fire suppression period of 1940 to 1979. So that's kind of the occurring, reoccurring cycle. So this drastically shifted the vegetation in the landscape um, from the indigenous cultivated oaks and pines to these new communities of maples, beech, hemlock, uh, yellow poplar, and hickories. And it was only in the early 2000s that Smokey the Bear's slogan, only you can prevent forest fires, was changed to only you can prevent wildfires. So that was from a, a push from uh, ecologists to kind of hammer home the point that not all fires are bad and destructive. Now with a better understanding of the balance of ecosystems and fires pivotal in them, we're kind of met with this increasing uh, precarious fire conditions across our warming planet. So our bodies and minds, um, as I have mentioned, are in many ways deeply connected to fire from its effect on early home and end brain development, presence in our cultures as a divine entity, uh, to mythological connections to sexuality, power, and knowledge. Indigenous and Western land cultivation has relied on fire, and our technological developments would not have progressed as they did without this elemental entity. Most of all, fire has maintained this balance of ecosystems, revitalizing soils and plant life cycles. So today, through combustion and the sun's rays, fire has actually you know, made space travel possible and renewable energy possible. So as our bodies continue to undergo these mental and physical stressors from climate change, the question remains, if you discover fire, what will you do with it? Innovate or find the nearest exit? To paraphrase author Buckminster Fuller in his 1981 book, Critical Path, we are able to live entirely within Earth's cosmic energy income instead of spending its cosmic energy savings account, i.e. the fossil fuels. To continue to do so is a spending folly no less illogical than burning your house and home to keep the family warm on an unprecedentedly cold midwinter night. For myself, the exhibition title, If You Discover Fire, brings into question how humanity will conceptualize its relationship to, and its collaboration with, fire's agency at this pivotal point in world history. I wholly believe that Western settler cultures need to reframe our relationship to the natural world, learning from indigenous knowledge and land stewardship. 
In light of continuing advancements in space travel, robotics, and green energy, will we try to regain the ecological balance or to colonize space? Thank you.